Hey, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today, I'm going to have a channeling session. It's been a while, but I've really been inspired to chat with this lady on camera. I've chatted with her privately, but I want to chat with her on camera and it's very, very timely. So today we are going to channel Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Former Supreme Court Justice, who is now in the afterlife. So we're gonna have a chat with her. So I would welcome in her energy. So I'm just gonna kind of bring it in. It's been a while since I've channeled on camera. So give me a second here to kind of really feel her. Oh, she looks a little younger than I would have expected. It's like you're aging backwards. Oh, thank you. She says, oh, thank you. It's like our skin looks really nice. <laughs> You're aging backwards, <laughs> Your Honor. I don't know what to call her. What can I call you? She says, you can call me whatever you want to call me. She says, you can call me Ruth, Ms. Ginsburg, <laughs> RBG. Can I call you RBG, please? I would love to call you RBG. She's like, oh, yes, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. So the RBG thing, how do you feel about being an icon? Because you are, you're like, now all of a sudden you're the face for democracy and women and, and human rights and social justice. You're like this face of it. Now, now, even from the afterlife more than ever, how do you feel about being an icon? She says, I don't, I don't particularly consider myself an icon. I think, she says, I would hope that I wouldn't need to be called out that separately and that uniquely. It would be a much better world if I were not considered to be that. If everyone, every woman could walk in my shoes. Eventually, do you think that will happen? Do you really see a time when women will literally be much more equal? and? and where women's rights will be human rights and, and social justice issues like racism and things will be, will be healed or there'll be more harmony or I don't even know. I mean, cause things like that aren't gonna just end and go away. There's a lot of injustice, a lot of a struggle. Hmm. Oh, she says, we are a work in progress. We are a work in progress. It's important to, to know what you believe to really understand how your beliefs do create, they do shape reality. They do shape the world outside of you. I, th I think many believe it's the opposite, that the world has its impact on you, but you, you have far more reach than you realize. She's like saying, I should not have to be an icon. That's not something I am proud of. I know there's been great strides made, and if I am part of that movement, I am, yeah, she says, I am proud to be part of that. But I am not the sole source of that. I'm not the only one. There have been many that have come before me and there will be many that come after me and hopefully there will be groups and masses side by side. And then I don't have to be such an anomaly, which, I never fancied myself much. It's very different, she says. It's very different, you know, when you are in, actually in the Supreme Court, actually in the halls of justice and side by side with others that you can have very powerful discussion and dialogue with and come to the point of understanding that it is the law that we are honoring. It is not our own individual belief systems that sways us. There is a, a deeper commitment and that's the harmony. That's the harmony that I think you are, are feeling for, Bridget. That's the harmony that you, you are craving in society. It's a common, a common understanding. It's not a belief. It's a common understanding. Well, you know what they say, RBG, common sense is not that common anymore. She 
says, yes, I've heard that. I've heard that. So I know that you had a relationship, a very close friendship with Justice um, Scalia and that he passed as well, just pre previous to you. I don't remember when exactly, six months ago, eight, a year ago. It's been, it's been a while. We've lost so many, she says. We've lost so many, there's been a lot of turnover. There's been a lot of turnover. It's unfortunate, the timing, isn't it? She says that. I did not say that. I did not say that above Life Channel, for the record. <laughs> of course, you don't know, because I'm channeling, and you don't, if you're not channeling, I would. She's the one that said that. <laughs> oh, I really like her. Oh, you have grit. You have what uh, Brene Brown would say, call grit. You have a tremendous amount of courage. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think it's something that you comes about in time. It's something you cultivate because you have to. It is a, a form of survival. It's essential. It's essential. What advice would you give to young people today, particularly underrepresented classes, women, minority groups? What, what kind of advice would you give? Leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Live so that others can, can live better. Leave a legacy. Live as though you are the most important, most powerful, most profound leader in the world. Act accordingly. Be respectful. Be kind. And you will shape those around you so much more than you know during your time on Earth. Leave a legacy. That one's powerful to me. I can feel that. I can really feel that one. You know, I've heard the, the phrase, you're never really a prophet in your own land. Actually, a mentor of mine mentioned that to me once. Oh, you're never a prophet in your own land, he said. And in that spirit, I can see that those, the civil rights leaders, the leaders for women's rights that have come before us, like Susan B. Anthony, we just celebrated the 100 years of women being able to have the right to vote. And I learned about how, historically, how that came about and how it was just this, it was the, person's, the person who voted's mother, I can't remember if it was from Tennessee, I can't remember where from now, but the person who voted, their mother is the one that influenced them and they changed their vote. So, I mean, it was expected to fail and it passed. And it was the, you know, the suffrage movement. It's, it's right that it's called suffrage. I mean, it's really a great on the backs of many others that have come before us. In fact, I had this conversation with my daughter and I hope it sinks in because there's, she's a millennial and, and like many, there are many that are very disenchanted with the whole political system. They don't understand how it could be a bunch of old white men and some women that are like conditioned like they're men and have to be in a man's world and all that. and that there's really no say for young people, men or women, you know, minority or, or white people. It doesn't, I mean, there's really nobody that represents a, a cross section of society according to her, okay? So there's a lot of disconnect in the issues and what matters most and that these old practically dead guys is what she would say. They're practically dead, mom. They're practically dead. Why would I vote for them? <laughs> I'm like, Check out who the vice presidents are, my dear, is usually my response. Well, check out the vice presidential candidates. That's why they're important. 
<laughs> Couldn't resist the sassiness, you guys. Couldn't resist. So what would you say to those, those millennials? What would you say to them about their voices, about democracy, about participation? I mean, it is an election year. We've got an election coming up here in the United States. Well, you can't convince someone. You can't really speak to them with such strong conviction that it will compel them to vote or to act in a way or to change their behaviors or beliefs. It's not, that, that never works in society. We have proof that that does not work. When you push against, you get pushed back. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a tweetable. RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that's a tweetable. When you push against, they push back. It's more so the opportunity to hear firsthand from personal experiences, people's stories of their experiences provide much more of a compelling reason to vote or to engage or to participate. So often we wait until we're invited in. We're not really invited in. Nobody actually invites you into the conversation. You come forcibly into the conversation, many on a, a boat filled with the rivers of tears, of grief. This is really powerful. Like I see this metaphor of this boat floating on tears from pain that people have experienced, like people who've experienced losing family members by suicide get called into action and advocacy to help prevent other families from experiencing the terrible loss. There becomes work on mental health and health care to provide services for people, counseling, stuff in the schools, all that. The same with, with other, other very painful experiences or tragic events that happen that touch people, it, that's what calls them in. It forces them in. The pain pushes them in to the arenas, into the voting booths, into the community boardrooms, into the conversations that are hard to have because the conversations are not nearly as hard as the, to deal with as the pain that they face every single day. It's not about stripping someone's rights away from them or taking something away from them. It's about the pain and the loss that they feel. And when people feel that, that gap, that separation, that inequality, that is when they wake up and they become, they realize that they have a choice to make to become part of the problem or part of the process. And some will not choose the process. And we have no control over that. But a way to persuade, a very powerful method of persuasion is to share the story. The painful story of personal loss, compelling reason to change laws, to create laws, to protect, to provide opportunity, to end suffering. So I'm going to ask this question because I'm not afraid of comments. I'm not afraid of comments anymore because you, Justice Ginsburg, have given me some confidence. Mm -hmm. If I can help people through this, I'm going to do it. And so too, then, I will advocate for your spirit, regardless of your political party affiliation. Okay. So there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court now with your departure. We do thank you for your service. But is there a greater purpose for your leaving now? The timing is extremely suspect. Can you talk about the timing of your departure and how you feel about what happens next? That's the political party, guys. You might want to just skip this part of the video. <laughs>
At least I didn't bring my signs in. I thought about it, but I didn't. <laughs> she's smart, you guys. Oh, she's literally threw back at me something that I believe and say, that's, the, that's how you do it, huh? She said, there's no such, there really is not, nothing as time. Time is meaningless. It means less from here, she says. <laughs> Good play on words. Time is meaningless. You got that, you guys? Justice Ginsburg in the afterlife, time is meaningless. It means less over here. It means less from here. Was it from here? It means less from here. Get the quote right. <laughs> Put it on a bumper sticker. It means less from here. <laughs> okay, so, but from here, it seems very poignant. She says, um, it's like out with a bang. She says, gotta shake things up a bit. She says, the legacy portion creating waves despite what people may believe about me they've made me sort of a a rebel uh, a bit notorious <laughs> despite what people may believe about my persona i really wouldn't say that i chose to leave with great intent to create more chaos certainly it would be a matter of of opinion if the world is in chaos or if the united states is, is really struggling or suffering at this point i think however many would consider that factual for my last act to be leaving a legacy of chaos or stirring up some trouble might be what you would expect from a liberal woman after all she says liberal left-wing woman radical woman she says all of us all of us the fact that you're a woman makes you radical she says the fact that you're a woman in a position that is dominated by men that makes you rebellious. That's crazy. Now that is not radical or rebellious at all. Being a woman in a job that is traditionally male in an environment that is traditionally dominated by men, that's not rebellious nor radical. That's simply trying to break through the barriers that have been previously set and creating new pathways, forging new pathways, more opportunities for all, for everyone who is qualified, competent, and capable. Qualified, competent, and capable is what she says, you guys. I love her attitude. It is awesome. She is smart, and she kind of has that grit. I think she has to. I think she's had to. Trail blazer, blazer, way shower. That's how I would honor you. I would consider you a divine woman. I would honor you as a way shower and a trailblazer, as a change maker, Justice Ginsburg. It's just so honoring, honored to, to be able to connect with you on, on the video because I've talked to her already. <laughs> I can, you know, it's, it's a perk of the job. So you didn't choose to leave on purpose to create some wakes to make some waves in the ocean to create some tidal waves or tsunamis perhaps to shake things up or wake people up oh no she says oh no you give me too much credit but i but but if that's what you would like to believe you can so 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 believe it <laughs> but no no it was time for me to go i needed to let myself as a human have many choices that I would afford or encourage others to have as well. So it was, it was purposeful, but it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine alone to choose. Although I did have the choice. 
Okay, can you, I don't understand that. So you didn't have the, ch you had the choice, but it wasn't yours alone. So is it a greater power at work? And if so, can you talk about that? What is that? For the greater good. For the greater good. Okay, you do know that there's like a Supreme Court nominee that was nominated that happens to be a woman, very conservative woman, completely the opposite on multiple positions that you took, which you would expect because the president that's nominating is of the of a re Republican nature where you were nominated by a Democratic president. So it would make sense that it would be different. But she's also, she could be on the court for 30 years and very conservative, very conservative. And like extreme, like way, like no Sandra Day O'Connor here, not even close to that. And how could you have wanted that? Like, would you have wanted that? The future is not my choice. It is not for me to choose. I don't determine the fate. <laughs> the fate of the free world is not upon my life or death. Any one person should not hold that much power with their presence nor with their absence. And the very fact that people are so taken with my absence says a lot about where society is at right now and what needs to happen, how we need to, you need to continue on, continue the work, join the process, come together in every possible way that you can engage, participate. It's, and then she tells me, she likes showing, showing me a quote, like the world is changed by your actions not your opinions. And she's also showing me the world is, the people that make a difference are the people that show up. That's just that, the people that show up. Good or bad, supportive, not supportive, that kind of a thing, that show up. What do you say to the people that are worried about then the future of this extremely, um, there's a lot of fear around the Supreme Court and all the power that the Supreme Court has and how it's not going to be balanced anymore because one president, one, choosing three justices, three, that's a lot of influence. And especially with such divisiveness among the part, political parties, there's not, there's no, oh, we need buy-in from the other side. Nobody's working together, at least in enough of a, it's not happening enough where the general public of, of the United States, the Americans don't notice it. It's just. It's like, hey, we have enough people, too bad, sucks to be you, you're gonna lose, like that. Like that's the mentality and that's okay. Like, that's like the code of conduct. Like that's not even, that's really upsetting to some. And to others, it's like, hey, natural selection. It's the way of the world, the people in power get to choose and that's everybody else is just too bad for you. So you need to get power. How do you get power? by participating, she says, by showing up. You have to show up. But it can't just be a one-time thing, she says. It's not a one-time thing. You have to be in the process, in it. You can't just show up and then leave and show up and then leave only when it's good for you or convenient for you. You have to do it when it's hard. You have to do it when it's hard. When it's not easy, you have to speak up. When you're uncomfortable, you have to share your values, your beliefs, and help another person, value another life. It's not just about you as an individual, it's about you collectively. And the liberty, your liberty depends on it. The, the things that you hold so sacred, liberty. She says liberty, she's not saying freedom, she's saying liberty. So the word liberty is coming through strong. Interesting, interesting. So you would say to those people to participate. I can think of a really easy way to participate, vote. Vote, regardless of what your political beliefs are, your opinions are, just vote. Both sides, vote, vote. I'm not gonna make any predictions, I don't do that. <clears throat> I think that's what whatever's unfolding needs to happen in order for a restart or a reboot. So a couple of nights ago, I was talking to my sister and we were talking about this, about 
about um, your, your opening, the vacancy now in the Supreme Court, and about, of course, we knew there would be a woman nominated, so there was, and my sister and I were having a conversation about that, and we both agreed that whatever happens with the nominee is kind of supposed to happen, like things need to kind of unfold. The processes cannot be stopped um, and shouldn't be rushed or stopped or slowed or obstructed. Things should just be able to flow like they normally would. But there's all this like push and pull and push and pull and it's just not helpful for anybody and for the nominee, I mean, it's got to be really difficult for the nominee. Whoever it would be, it's got to be difficult for that person. And they're not supposed to be political anyway, the justices, you guys. They're not supposed to be. Not supposed to be. And if, we, as we've noticed with the past, previous um, positions that the court has taken, they seem to be focusing on, like you said, Ruth, with the order of law, the law and not having allegiances or alliances with any particular president or, or group party or that kind of a thing. And so the feeling is, is that someone, my sister and I were talking about this, we were talking and then you came in right away and literally said, it has to be this way. It has to be so much that society completely starts the grassroot effort again. It has to. You don't have to roll back and start totally from scratch. You're not starting from scratch. Do not be, mis do not be mistaken. You are not starting from zero, but you are starting. You start right where you're at and you start and you do grassroots, you work in the communities, you expand your, your connections, you build relationships, and you build, and you build, and you build, and that momentum is powerful. Participation and engagement is the true power. And just look, look at what's happening in the political arenas. Engagement is feared. People, regular human beings, regular American people participating, that's the greatest fear of power is participation of the masses. So our participation, our very showing up is power. And, the, and that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's absence was in part to create a new place to start from and to do grassroots and to build. She created a solid foundation for us to build upon. Don't focus on any one thing too much. Focus on where you can influence, where you can make a difference in your homes, in your communities, in your cities, in your states, in your, in your, community, in your groups that you're in online, fighting and pushing and yelling and screaming and being hurtful and creating more pain is not part of this process, the building process. The building process is unity, participation, and that's what power is afraid of. Power fears participation of the masses because you can't control everyone. That's why. There is power in numbers. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. This has been awesome and amazing and the sun is coming out. It's been kind of foggy here today, you guys, and a little windy. I'm actually in my new office space. It used to be a actual greenhouse room. My husband used to grow orchids in here and we decided that with everybody home all the time, I needed a place to work and because everybody's in my space, you know, my office was like my kitchen table. So guess what? We moved kitchen table down here. <laughs> we have a new one up in the dining room there is a kitchen table it's not a card table and we moved it down here and here i am in the greenhouse isn't that cool <laughs> nature all around me you'll see that in future videos so thanks so much for being here you guys i hope you've enjoyed this very timely channeling video we've been channeling with ruth bader ginsburg former supreme court justice from the afterlife so regardless of your political preferences or whichever way you slide along that left-right kind of range scale, I'm glad that you're here and I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. I hope you get inspiration from it because as always, Above Life Channel, the intention here is to inspire your spirit to fill you with hope. Participate, you guys, participate. And it's your life after all, so show up for it. Just show up and participate. 
Before you leave, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you never miss a new video, whether that be the Sunday morning coffee series that I've been sharing here on Above Life channel or channeling videos. Check out the playlist for more channeling videos if this is what you like. Thanks for being here.